to where we are going or hope to go, we give up hope in discouragement and frustration. Last week, the children played a, a fun game. You know, those children that, that um, came and we sat with, and, and a couple of you helped in the, bu- in the uh, brunch line. And they were playing a game called telephone, and as I mentioned, and their, their answers at the end were always so hopeful. But when we play telephone in the terms of gossip, is our answer after we've repeated something over and over again, is it the message that we began with one of hope or is it one of despair? What we encounter makes it difficult to maintain hope, particularly with respect to politics and social and world issues. Hope can be shut down at the point of thinking we're at the end of the road, we've obtained our aim, when in reality, actually, it still lies ahead of us. Like students who graduate from high school or college thinking that education is complete with the receipt of that piece of paper. Those who have no hope do not come to John. Why should they come to John? They have no hope. After all, they tell themselves this world will be the same forever and ever. Amen. It's over. With nothing to look forward to, they, they stay way clear of that River Jordan, and they stay clear of all those people of hope. They don't want to be around people of hope. And those who consider their lives of holiness to have been attained to perfection, those who think they've already arrived, they already have it better, they've already attained it, they don't come to John either. That is, not until they see John as a threat to their comfortable way of life. And when the hope of others becomes too much, They show up. They appear at the Jordan River just to cover their bets. Now John sees these folks, these Pharisees and Sadducees, as hope hoarders. And he calls out to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Then perhaps because he has figured out what what they're thinking, John adds, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. So in other words, even if you don't show up, God is able to make something even out of stones. In other words, to put it even more crudely, Your your comfortable little world is on the way out. A new world, a different kind. The kingdom of God is going to come, just like the one that Isaiah promised. You can do all of your work against it. You can diminish hope at every step of the way. You can be threatened by enthusiasm and hope, but it will not be wiped out. And that's the good news. We can imagine, you know, those, those good religious folks, you know, the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees kind of bristling with indignation. You know, they have a good life. They've got it all figured out. You know, they occupy all the positions of privilege. And people of privilege will fight tooth and nail to secure their existing stability, their security, the law and order that protects them. And anyway, who is this maniac anyway that comes to us dressed like this and eats locusts and honey and smells? Who is this filthy, wild person? And conflict isn't too far around the corner. So much for any kind of a better life or truer or more authentic relationships. The pregnancy of hope is terminated. 
The text places the choice clearly before us during this season of Advent. To which group do we belong? Are we among those that have given up? Who did not come to John at all because we've got it all figured out? We've already given up hope. Or are we the people who have hardened our hearts and do not want to change? We don't want to hear that repentance is metanoia and we get hung up in the little things rather than seeing things with, with new eyes or trying to... One of the things is we always judge other people by what we see. We judge ourselves by our, by our best intentions, forgetting that everyone else has best intentions. So have we hardened our hearts to the best intentions? Or are we standing on the Jordan River, pregnant, expecting, hopeful, hearing God's voice speaking through John, looking for a new life, a fresh start? Right around me, right here. My Aunt Jenna and my Uncle Eddie said little about the baby they hoped to bring into the world. Out of the realistic possibility that at their ages, they were in their 40s, and with all their past experiences, they might not go to term. And with each passing day as the fetus grew, so did their hope. And when their daughter, my cousin, Pamela Jean, was born a healthy, beautiful little girl, it was as if heaven and earth had come together and they were shouting for joy. What wondrous love, born and born in hope. Are we pregnant? expecting, hopeful now, with Advent's hope, with John the Baptist's hope, with hope that God's kingdom is coming to earth. Are we? I baptize you with water, says John, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is our faith under mercy.
thing happened to you this week? What good thing? Um, some of you may remember my nephew, um, Dan Baker, they came from little kids to grown up. He went to West Point, got married. Last week, he and his wife had their first baby, um, Nora Rose, and um, family is doing well. They live out at the um, Army Post in um, Tacoma. Well, I had a good thing. I got to have a wonderful supper with uh, Phyllis and Austin on Thursday night, and that was a very good thing. So generous God. And we got to celebrate Anna Mae Callahan's 93rd birthday together on Tuesday, the 30th, and very alert, very happy, so we are so glad we had that time to spend with her. Generous God. Any others? This past week, we had we have flowers up um, here in the chancel area. Uh, one of the arrangements is from he Helen Hoschultz's funeral that was here on, on Monday. And the, the other uh, arrangement by the Paschal Candle is from um, Doug uh, Mealhouse's funeral. So, generous God, as we continue to hold their families in uh, your prayerful presence uh, during the time of mourning. We also, with heavy hearts um, this morning, um, say that our friend, um, our member, our loved one, Austin Brandt, um, passed away suddenly on early Friday, Friday morning. And um, his family is here, and we're grateful for, for you being here. And uh, his visitation will be here in our church and, uh, at 4 o'clock tomorrow, Monday, to 7 o'clock. And then the funeral will be here at 10.30 on Tuesday. So generous God, as we prepare and as we mourn in this season, are there any other prayers? We continue to pray for Kay Santman. Um, we continue to pray for her. Um, she is uh, they're not receiving visitors yet. Um, she's still pretty tired and, and so on, but she's receiving continuous care at St. Luke Hospital. Her address is in the back of the bulletin board. And um, you can write cards, send gifts, uh, whatever you want to do. They're going to be decorating her room with a uh, more holiday kind of spirit of things. And I will be, on December 21st, we'll be bringing a, um, a Christmas worship service to them um, in the hospital on uh, December 21st. And if that sounds like 21st, it is the winter solstice. It's the longest night of the year. Often people call the service that we do on the 21st the longest night of the year, hard to be happy, blue Christmas service. Because we, it's a long word, and it, it's a long thing because there are times in, in during these holidays that some of us are, are also mindful of our losses, especially our first anniversaries or those that... Um, that died uh, close to the holidays. Um, my cousin Pam, who I happened to mention in the, the sermon, um, her mom's uh, funeral was on Christmas Eve. So um, you can imagine. So that service on the 21st um, at the hospital. So generous God. Are there any others this morning? We pray for all of those um, that have suffered through fires in Gatlinburg on Tennessee. Um, generous God. Then, Lord, meet us in the silence and hear our prayer.
O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. O holy child, enter our lives again with childlike faith. May we see you and your work in our world in new ways. May we be open to the Holy Spirit as a child, just learning about faith. May we see what you are already doing in our lives and in our world with fresh hearts so that we can participate in your reign now and in the time to come. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. So let us now offer our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings for Christ's work in this this faith community and as we reach um, out into the world. Please join with me. Friends, we are called to welcome one another, just as Christ has welcomed each of us. Let us walk in the light of God, that we may abound in hope and peace. We bring the best of ourselves and our offerings to God's church and world. You may be seated. Friends, again, we gather around God's table of mercy and sure abundance, a table gladly bearing signs of life and goodness for all. In this moment, in this sacred space, God comes to us and satisfies our yearnings, yet not in supernatural or interventionist kinds of ways that only tear at delicate fabrics of human hope and trust. You know, God has come and continues to come as that resilient life force alive within every given reality, every molecule and cell, calling us to life and courage towards renewed vision and practice and towards greater care for the earth, its creatures, and each other. For this unfolding gift, we are grateful for this living hope we offer ourselves. And so, as Jesus broke bread and shared wine, revealing before his friends the powerful, shy reality of God, we do likewise, so as to be astonished anew and to be transformed yet again. Spirit of Christ, Spirit of life, come and bless what we do here. May our eating and our drinking and the love of God broaden the way we think, deepen the way we feel, and send us out with renewed confidence into the world of your continued weaving. The womb of heaven is everywhere. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we together as a new creation and a new community around the globe may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, help the body of Christ be one. Help the left hand and the right hand work as one ministry in all the world. Help the eyes and the ears sense your presence in coming kingdom. Bring the blessing of the diversity of the body to bear fruit until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, 
All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because Christ is the host of this table, therefore all are welcome and are invited to receive. You'll be receiving communion by intinction. Um, you'll be, um, you can hold your hands out to receive, and you'll receive a piece of the communion bread. You'll hear the words, body of Christ. And then you'll be offered the cup of salvation, and you'll be invited to dip the bread, the body of Christ, into the cup of salvation, and then you may eat it. And for those that want to kneel after receiving communion, you would want to come to this station up front, which will be Kent and Ian will be uh, serving communion in the front. And in the back will be um, Deb and myself. And we will bring communion. So you can come to us and we'll also, Deb and I will bring communion to those that are in their, in their seats. So please come. All will be ready. And, and you can start coming. 